Okay, welcome to Bloodhound Picks for one of our special segments for our Horror Not Fear campaign. Um, I am one of your hosts, Craig. I'm Kyle. And this is Josh. And today we're going to talk about some of our favorite black horror films. So, each one of us picked three or four. We'll just kind of highlight them. To help bring a little bit more awareness, some of these are famous, some of them are maybe might be a little bit more are a little bit more um, unknown. Like, Come on, Craig, spit yeah, it out. <laughs> <laughs> We've been recording a couple episodes now, so start get out of it. Okay, oh, yeah. um, but yeah, we're going to just talk about them and highlight them, and we're going to be doing this for a couple other things that we'll bring up later on, but this t- is our first topic on the subject matter. So, how do we want to go about doing this? Do we want to go one to, by one? Or? I think we should yeah, do round table. All of them. Well, you know what I mean? Like, okay. somebody gets a turn. Okay. Um, so, I go for, so, the first on my list, I chose this initially um, because it is, it is argued that it isn't a uh, superhero movie and it is it's the blade one and two with wesley snipes um i also wanted to deal with films that or pick a film that did really well at the box office and kind of um touch on that a little bit because a lot of times they say you know until what was it black panther or get out came out they would talk about how these films weren't marketable or they didn't do well to a broad audience, but Blade did very well. Um, and there's always the argument of this was kind of the first of the, the Marvel films to really create what Marvel is now. People say it was the X-Men movies or Spider-Man or whatever, but this really did get the ball rolling for that with its success. Um, you've probably heard of or have seen the movies are well already blade two has guillermo del toro is the director and when i first when i was younger and i loved watching these i'd always choose blade one because it has that great opening what is it blood rave sequence and yes. there's all this great elements but then that shit del- is so good <laughs> but then del toro um yeah he kind of he basically upped it in terms of like making it. I don't even know what it what it's called. It's not cyberpunk or whatever. It's like the what everybody was doing in the late '90s, early 2000s because of the Matrix, where it's like the black trench coats and it's all gothic and whatever the new metal and everything. And it's over the top in its style. But no, I've kind of always loved these films. I also. I think the movie itself, the original, is set in New York, even though Blade, the character, is it's closer to my heart because it's supposed to be in Detroit, which I always thought would be a lot of fun if they did it in there itself. But no, they're, I don't know. Th- this one's hard to talk about, and the fact that I'm sure most people listening are a lot have already seen it, but no, it's just a great, they're just great action flicks. Um, they, I think they balance the horror and the, the action pretty well for those type of movies because some of them kind of delve a little bit too much in the horror, some not really that way, but some delve too much in the action aspect or vice versa or whatever. And I think Blade's just this kind of badass character that, you know, it's, it's, there's a good reason why it kind of made Wesley Snipes this huge star for at least a little bit until... You know, then he went to jail for tax evasion or whatever happened to him. We don't but talk would, about that. Yeah, I would still watch another Wesley Snipes, Snipes Blade movie, and I'd be the first in line to see it. Um, I won't mention the third movie because, yeah, it kind of goes a little bit off the rails. But the first two are great. And Del Toro, he ended up using those same, the Reapers, which are the vampire creatures that hunt vampires, I guess, for those of you that don't know. It's a mute. That's another mutation. Um, he used the Reaper 
kind of style in his show, well, his book, the comic book and show, The Strain, which they're, you know, they're more in line with those types. And I, I don't know, I think they're pretty cool, awesome, and you know, there's some great one-liners that Wesley Snipes says constantly. It's His whole dialogue is basically a bunch of one-liners, and I don't know, I'm there for every second of it. I rewatch them. Con- they're probably some of my most rewatched movies. I'll just throw on just because I just love it. So, yeah, um, that's my first one is Blade. And if you haven't seen Blade 1 and 2 and want to know where Marvel movies all kind of really started booming, check it out because that's where they did. All right. Yeah, those are great. I haven't watched them in a long time, but I used to watch those all the time too. Yeah. Um, so my first one is the people under the stairs, which I assume everyone has seen, (laughs) which is kind of obvious, but it's still so damn great. Um, I did a whole little video on this, but, um, yeah, I love this movie. It's interesting because it's, um, still early before there's like a lot of black horror, I think besides kind of the black exploitation stuff in the seventies that I know we're going to touch on, um, you know, early nineties, there wasn't a ton. So it's kind of interesting to have that focus. Cause we all know the genre kind of tends to have black characters that get killed right away, or they're just kind of a token character or maybe that, you know, at best they're like the guy and, um, and I'm going to forget the character's name. And Craig hasn't seen Dream Warrior, so he can't help me. Yeah. <laughs> but there's a black character in that who's like there. Kincaid. Yeah. Kincaid. <laughs> yeah. Who, but, you know, he's still just like a sidekick. He's kind of a badass, but he's still a very small character for the most part. Um, so People Under the Stairs is kind of unique that it has like that. It's not an all black cast, but they're all the protagonists. Um, full of great one liners, too. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's just. I don't know. It's a fucking great movie. It's one of my, it's possibly my favorite Wes Craven movie. <laughs> I think I it, it, yeah, it might be like his best social commentary. Yeah. I mean, I guess. And it deals a lot with gentrification, which I think is very topical now. And I mean, that's what the whole plot is basically around, if you have not seen it. Yeah, and it's sadly still very relevant. <laughs> yeah. I guess. Our world has not changed. I like and, the uh, fact too that it's a it's a African American kid too as yeah. the protagonist. Yeah. So yeah, the, yeah, like the person that in any other horror movie at that point is definitely gonna die. <laughs> I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I guess before we move on to Josh's pick, first pick, um, a lot of these are not Blade. Well, I think no. Well, it might be, but check out the documentary if you want to know more on it. Horror Noir. I think it's free to watch right now, but it's on Shutter. Um, mm-hmm. It might be on AMC as well. But then there's a podcast where you can get a lot of the uncut interviews as well, and and it's a book too. But these are a lot of these movies will be mentioned in it, kind of discussed a little bit more in depth than, of course, we are right now as just highlighting them. Yeah. But, yeah, Josh. Okay, so I'll just do the one that started it all. Uh, that would be 1972's Blackula. Um, I watched that. I wa- I rewatched it uh, last week, um, and it, it, I had seen it a few times. It had been a while, um, but I mean, it doesn't really get any more, you know, like, uh, African American cinema than, than Blackula. And, uh, it, it essentially was the, uh, pioneer of black exploitation, um, starting in 1972. Um, and, you know, it's funny that the film begins with, uh, the, the, the lead character in 1700s Transylvania at the Count Dracula castle and Count Dracula is of course the whitest guy that there is. <laughs> and he's talking about, you know, um, I can't remember precisely what it is, but it, it, it was 
something about slavery and how um you know basically the slave trade doesn't it or it's that's, part of the slave trade yeah that's it yeah and so you know then the the douche whitey uh count dracula turns the main character into a vampire and imprisons him for hundreds and hundreds of years uh until um he's basically um unintentionally resurrected in LA in 1972 essentially um and then the story you know is is essentially uh i mean it's not bram stoker's dracula but it's very similar um but obviously we're in LA in 1972 uh with a predominantly you know african american cast and it, it's 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 like urbanized uh dracula but um yeah, Blackula is uh, is something else, and they don't they don't really make them like they used to in terms of in terms of that one. So, and it's brought up a lot, but of course, there's that there's that famous slow motion scene that oh right really, yeah, it's kind of one of the first ones to do that where she's running at the was it the coroner or the doc I can't remember no. but. Yeah, and it's also, I don't know what made me think of this, but it's also got some really badass, like, Saul Bass-type credits yeah. at the beginning. Uh, that, uh, when I saw it again, I had forgotten about it, but it was almost like uh, the director was, like, making a comment how this is, like, the the Hitchcock version of, of the Dracula story, in a way. I don't know, it's just kind of funny. But it's on Shudder, so check it out. Yeah. Yeah, Shutter. It's only well. I don't know if it they've upped their price, but it was for a year, like fifty dollars or four dollars a month or something like that. So it wasn't. Yeah, it's not bad at all. The price, and it has a lot of great kind of things. Um, so my next one, and kind of dealing with this, is one of my big ones. I'm a huge, huge fan of Tales from the Crypt. This was one of my early kind of entries into the horror genre I, I think maybe but i'm talking about tales from the crypt demon knight directed by ernest dickerson who um he's kind of mainly got famous for being a cinematographer for many spike lee movies but he's also a, an amazing director and i kind of always i want to see him do more a lot of the time because i love demon knight that much and the story itself um, is about a man named William Sad Sadler <laughs> that's not the character's name that's the actor's name who is being chased by a demon named Billy Zane <laughs> <laughs> and it's probably Billy Zane's best role I will argue with that he's just over the top and um, it turns out that he is the defender of basically the world of the light of the world. And, but when the stars align and there's enough people and everything, they end up converging and it's the final kind of battle until without, well, I will be spoiling um, for until the next battle starts with whoever the new demon and whoever the new defender of the light will be, which it ends up being Jada Pinkett at the time, also known now as Jada Pinkett Smith. But no, I think, again, that one, it's a lot of fun. Um, I think it, it does one of those things where it keeps the that fun element of Tales from the Crypt, but also makes it a worthwhile feature, which I know there was a lot of issue with Tales from starting out could a tales from the crypt move story really go a whole feature length long because you know the the stories themselves are normally cut and dry their morality tales they're kind of with you know horrible people doing horrible things and getting their comeuppance and but they do something different with it and they kind of make the this ragtag team that it's a siege movie and Billy Zane the whole time is trying to seduce each of them and they're each going through their different kind of 
Um, sedu seduction, some of them give in, some of them don't. Um, but I'd say if you can, I don't actually know. I have the Shout Factory special Blu-ray of it, but I don't know where you can find it online for free for those of you interested in watching it. But yeah, I love the movie. And again, like Blade, it's one of those ones that I will rewatch a lot. Yeah, it's a great one. It's uh, yeah. Ernest Dickerson. Yeah, needs to do more stuff. I know he's he does a lot of TV now, but yeah, he is pretty great. Um, and Thomas Hayden Church and yeah. uh, Dick yeah. Miller are in it. I mean, <laughs> yeah, the cast is just great. Yeah, the cast is fucking awesome. And um, it's supposed to be um, a whole. They end up doing, you know, of course, what is it? Bordello of Blood. And, but yeah. that, <laughs> that movie was supposed to set up a whole series of Tales from the Crypt movies. Until that came out. Yeah. <laughs> Dennis Miller in Bordello Good of God. Blood. <laughs> Probably not a great choice. Yeah. Seriously. <laughs> yeah. Um, so my next one... I feel like it's, well, it is an anthology, but it, it's kind of almost the same time as Demon Knight. So I don't know. They always like go together in my head, but Tales from the Hood, um, which I think is a lot better than it got credit for. I don't know. I re I've read a lot of reviews or people's comments that it's very kind of heavy handed and not that good, but I just rewatched it like last week. And I still think it's pretty great. There's a couple segments that don't fully work, but the ideas are good. Um, but that's like every anthology, I feel. Yeah. You can never get like four. I don't know. It can never be perfect. There's always going to be at least one that's like, oh, that kind of sucked. Yeah. <laughs> um, speaking of, the David Allen Greer segment <laughs> is not that great. It's okay. And the one with the puppets isn't the greatest one. But the first one is really great. And Clarence Williams the third is a fucking awesome version of the Crypt Keeper, essentially, his own yeah. kind of spin on it, introducing the tales and stuff. Yeah. Um, but I think there's some solid social commentary underneath all of it, you know, whether some of the segments work or not. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. I haven't seen part two. Um, I heard it wasn't that good, but yeah, it didn't. I've heard, it, I've heard it's one of the worst movies of the year that it came out. <laughs> but Keith David's in it, so yeah. I mean, I'm I might try it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> why not? I know that was that was on Netflix for a bit. It might was still it? be uh, part two. Yeah, I'm yeah. not sure where it's at now, but. Yeah, well, part one's good. Yeah. What are you going to do? Yeah. <laughs> what do you got, Josh? Okay, so uh, I'll stick with the theme that I had beginning with Blackula and go with uh, Vampire in Brooklyn. Um, if for no other reason, then uh, it was made by one of my favorite people ever, uh, Wes Craven. Um it, it is essentially, it's funny that, that it, it kind of has a lot in common with Blackula in that, uh, you know, not, now we're obviously, we're not in LA, we're in, we're in uh, the, the, yeah, we're in the, well, more specifically the, the kind of 100%, uh, you know, African American uh, neighborhood esque parts of Brooklyn. Um, because a lot of the action, you know, is in apartments or yeah. it's in neighborhoods, essentially. Um, and obviously, Eddie Murphy, uh, maybe not obviously, but Eddie Murphy is, you know, your your Dracula character, um, your vampire in Brooklyn. Um, and he does a lot of very Eddie Murphy things in Vampire in Brooklyn. Um you know, of course, he plays multiple characters. Uh, and it was interesting. I was reading something before we started this uh, show. Um, and I guess Eddie Murphy 
did not want the film to be funny at all. Yeah. That's what um, I heard, yeah. Yeah, which I thought was really interesting. Um, and I even read something where Wes was talking about how he was actually getting like mad that Wes Craven wanted it to be funny. Um, mm. Because he... I, apparently, apparently, Eddie Murphy wanted to be 100% straight-laced and serious. Uh, which is funny when you think about how non-straight-laced the film is. Um and it's not just Eddie Murphy. It's literally every character. Um, is, you know, no one's taking anything seriously. So I thought that was an interesting I, remark. I mean, I think, I know Kyle mentioned it before, but it is one of those that kind of has that tonal where you can tell. It has that tonal imbalance, I guess, where there's some parts that are like very serious. And, yeah. But then some parts that are like the slaps. There's not, it's not like, melded together well and anytime eddie anytime eddie murphy shows up as the other characters he plays and it just yeah. you know just gets so ridiculous i guess yeah, yeah. not in a bad way but it's pretty over the top yeah he's <laughs> just eddie murphy doing eddie murphy things which is more times than not hilarious yeah I almost picked this one. I can remember like rushing out to rent this movie on VHS because I like Wes Craven <laughs> when I was a kid. Uh, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Craig's right, though. I think it's totally weird. It's interesting to it see, is. though, because it is yeah. like well crafted and it's like mm. you can tell he had a fucking huge budget. I, I rewatched it because yeah. I was thinking about doing it. And they, like when they're introducing like whatever character, um, the guy who ends up being Eddie Murphy's like Renfield. And there's those, mm. like there's a car chase, you know, within like the first 15 minutes and all this stuff that just like soup. You're just like, this is ridiculously big budget for no reason. Yeah. Yeah. You can tell. Yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> my final one will be, um, the experimental horror film from, I believe it was, yeah, 1973, Ganja and Hess, which stars um, Dwayne Jones, who is primarily known as the protagonist in the original Night of the Living Dead. Um, Ganja and Hess is one of those that, I know Spike Lee remade it. Um, this was it The Sweet Blood of Baby Jesus. Or the, I think it's just The Sweet Blood of Jesus. Sweet Blood of Jesus. We can make a vampire film called the Sweet Blood of Baby yeah. Jesus, and it'll be a baby <laughs> vampire. That'd be good. Um, <laughs> yeah, the Sweet Blood of Jesus. Um, so, anyways, this is one of those ones that got this whole re-edit when it was first coming out because it was too much of a drama and too experimental, and they wanted to, and it got renamed where they wanted to make it more in line with the, the black exploitation movies. And then they more recently, they finally just kind of on shutter actually. And you can find it also on Amazon prime for free. They released it as it's like, the original intention. I guess of the movie. And it kind of has a lot of those elements that we've seen a ton now, but it was, would have been one of the earliest ones to do it where um, it deals more with vampirism as this addiction or this liberation for some people um, where, you know, you have thirst, you have, um, was it Larry Fessenden's Habit, um, all the way up until more recently you have um, the film Bliss, which, you know, kind of features a little bit more bloodshed and gore and violence than those other ones, but where it, it tells this idea of addiction the story of a addiction or this or relationship drama in a way, but using um, vampire vampires as um, the thematic, I guess the story to tell the theme. And I think it's great. I think it's well acted. It is one that I will say for those that are wishing to watch it, it to treat it more. I don't go in uh, obviously expecting the jump out of your seat horror film because it is more like a drama in a sense. But no, I think this, I think it's, 
again, well acted, well directed, has kind of that natural feel. Um, if it was made by today's standards, I think it would have been, it would be lumped in a way, you know, with what people considered that mumble core or stuff like that, which some of those movies are um, already that I already mentioned. But yeah, if you haven't seen it, check it out because it's very good. Yeah, I need to watch it. I've been meaning to forever. It looks like it's going to be good. Um, All right, so my next one, or my last one, is uh, Sugar Hill, jumping into the black exploitation. Um, I tried to watch Blackenstein, full disclosure. You know, I gave up after, like, halfway, because it was just ridiculous. It was too ridiculous. Why did you give up? I just, cause, cause, cause it was just like so cheesy to the extreme. I don't know. I, I couldn't. Yeah, it was a frontier, frontiers. I was like, <laughs> I don't care what's happening here. And then I was reading about the film and how the guy who played Blackenstein uh, was just a producer, because he was just a terrible actor. So he's like, just wanted to be in a movie. So he funded the movie basically. Um, I also tried to watch this movie called JD's Revenge. Which was decent, actually. That was kind of interesting. It had this actor from The Wire, and he was like a... Uh, basically, he was a guy in New Orleans, and he got possessed by like the soul of an old gangster. And so it's like kind of a possession movie or whatever. Um, but, <laughs> but I settled on Sugar Hill, which is a zombie um, black exploitation thing. Basically, this woman, Sugar Hill, her, her boyfriend gets killed pretty much right at the beginning of the movie. Um, and he owns this club Haiti that these gangsters like want to buy from him and he won't sell. And so she inherits it. And then, um, she hooks up with some kind of voodoo priestess and resurrects all these zombies who are like the dead are like dead slaves. But they say that for some reason they say that they're from Guinea which seems we I don't know it seems like they're kind of trying to dodge it really being about anything to do with like slavery um, I don't know it's it seemed like a weird backstory that didn't make sense but so she has these like more like the traditional zombies like an army of them and she goes to take revenge on these guys that killed her boyfriend it's pretty fun it's got its own yeah. theme song supernatural <laughs> voodoo woman uh, Motown records that was great um there's some good actors in it and it's it's i mean they're all these black exploitation ones are you know to a greater or lesser degree kind of cheesy but this one was a little bit more fun and interesting to see um a more modern version of the old traditional zombie i guess Mm -hmm. nice okay um I guess on to me, uh, and I guess my, for my final selection, uh, this might be, I don't know, I, I dare say a questionable choice, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and use uh, Ghosts of Mars. Um, <laughs> and Ghosts of Mars, I, I feel like it, it fits when you know that it was initially uh, going to be Escape from Mars, uh, which was going to be the third uh, Snake Plissken film. And Kurt Russell, who, if you don't know, is Snake, the character of Plissken, read the script and, as you would imagine, said, fuck no. <laughs> um, so... Essentially, uh, with with Kurt Russell bailing on on the project, uh, Carpenter just cut out some stuff, and um, he approached Ice Cube to take over the what would have been the the Pliskin role, and Ice Cube I don't think really thought it was that good either, but he is on record as saying. I got to fucking work with John motherfucking Carpenter. So, of course, I did it. Um, 
And and I guess you know, in terms of of bringing Ice Cube into the the Pliskin role, I think it 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 did kind of uh, uh, shift it a little more into you know what you could consider uh, black cinema example, um, simply because uh, you know clearly. Uh, since we know that it was uh, supposed to be a, a Snake Plissken sequel, uh, and and the Ice Cube character uh, becomes you know the the hero of the film, and um, yeah, he uh, uh, there's a lot of really um, unfortunate things that occur in Ghosts of Mars, but uh, um, I I feel like uh, and this is coming from the biggest John Carpenter fan on the planet. Um, there's a lot of unfortunate things that happen in Ghost of Mars, but the casting of Ice Cube in in the lead role was not one of them. Um, I think he does pretty well with what he's given. Um, certainly, uh, he does better than you know seasoned actors at the time, like Natasha Henstridge. Um, then again, uh, you know, with all the problems that 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 there are with with the script and with just everything about the movie. It's a wonder that, you know, it made it, it, it actually became a finished film, but um, yeah, it's definitely not one of Carpenter's best things, but you should still see it. It is a fun watch. If you kind of let it go is. of the, you know, yeah, it, it, it just gets, it's just, you know, wow, they, did he really just do that? Did he really <laughs> did he really just have a flashback and a voiceover going for 20 straight minutes and some other heinous bullshit? Fuck yes, he did. John Carpenter. <laughs> the, the monsters are awesome. Or the, yeah, the monsters are awesome. They are. Yeah, they're creepy yeah. as hell. And there's the famous, or at the end, which I pointed out to you, Josh, that one time. Um, where Ice Cube looks at the camera at the end. And John Carpenter, yeah. I guess the story goes, he just kept it in. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, they must have been saying cut or something, and Ice Cube looks over at the camera. I thought they... Yeah, it's just there. So if you were yeah. watching the movie, pay close attention to the last scene. <laughs> you'll see. Apparently everyone just gave up <laughs> at that point. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Carpenter's like, you know what? Fuck it. That's staying in there. So those were some of our favorites. Um, you know, feel free to mention some of your own favorites. Or, you know, if any of our recommendations get you to watch one of these movies, rewatch one of these movies. Stay with us for the next one of these Horror Not Fear segments where we come together and discuss some of our favorite favorite female directed horror films. And we're going to do a whole series, so feel free to recommend other genres, too. Like, we're going to do queer, and we're going to do probably Asian cinema, or maybe even break it up by country and stuff. So, yeah. And thanks for listening. Hey, this is Kyle just dropping in to let you know to please like, subscribe, follow, tweet, TikTok. Snapchat, do the social media things. We're starting a new little segment here called Word on the Street. Greetings and salutations, bloodhound pics. I would like you to know that your podcast has been a bomb to my troubled mind. I dare not think the acts I might commit were it not for bloodhound pics. Bloodhound Picks Podcast is produced by Josh Lee, Craig Dram, and Kyle Hintz. Music by Raymond Seed. Audio editing by Kyle Hintz.